If you want to hear my ideas about the meaning of Midsummer, then stick around to the end of this video. Welcome back to Things You Missed. I'm not going to attempt to fully explain every little image in this movie because there's so much packed into it, and I'm not familiar with the culture that it's based on. So in this video, I'm just going to tell you what I did notice, what connections I made, and what my interpretations are. So the movie starts with this painting of the village divided up into four sections, spring, summer, fall, and winter. This image establishes the cyclical themes that we'll see throughout the movie, the cycle of seasons throughout one year, the cycle of life, death, impregnation, and rebirth, and the actual class system that the commune uses. The Swedish American friend Pell explains that children under 18 are considered to be in the spring section of their lives. Spring is known for leaves starting to grow in the trees, so it goes along with their idea of children growing up, maybe even hitting puberty and growing hair. Ages 18 to 36 are considered to be summer, when the trees are at their fullest. Our characters fall into this age range, and they're in their prime during the movie. The events take place on Danny's birthday, drawing attention to the fact that we are supposed to notice that they're in their prime. There's even talk at the beginning that the boyfriend Christian could be wasting his time with Danny. They tell him that he could be with that waitress right now. And of course, the movie takes place in summer. I'm sure you didn't miss the title of the movie, Midsummer. Ages 36 to 54 are autumn, and this is when the leaves start to fall off the trees and they start to decline. This could be seen as when adults start losing hair and reaching the end of their reproductive fertility. Ages 54 to 72 are winter, which maybe explains why the cultists are so upset when Christian's friend Mark pees on the dead tree, because they see it as a symbol for their own past elders. When Danny asks what happens after 72, he gives her a cutthroat gesture. I think we see this happen in the ceremony on the second day that they're there, where two of the oldest looking villagers referred to as the Ones lead the feast and then sacrifice some blood on the ruins at the top of the cliff. The American characters are shocked by the diving scene that follows. Another cycle we see in the movie is the day-night cycle. Danny has a painting in her living room of two moons in the night sky. It provides a contrast to their destination in Sweden, where the days last twice as long as the nights. When they enter the village, they come through this big sun-shaped structure, and the platform at the center of the village has a sun painted on it. The city that they come from seems to be in the middle of winter, so they go from a winter with two moons to a summer with two suns. Also, when Christian is eventually garbed in the cult's traditional clothing at the end of the movie, a sun and a moon can be seen on his robes. There are more symbols about the circle of life, like when they first arrive and there's an older woman chanting prayers in what I'm assuming is Swedish. There are not always subtitles shown during these prayers, but this time there are, and she says, spirits back to the dead. Whenever Danny drinks that tea that gives her the drug trip, she sees grass growing on her feet, an image commonly associated with the idea that the dead are taken back by nature. When the tourists get freaked out by the cliff jumping scene, one of the village elders tries to calm the girl down by explaining that life is a circle and it's actually a great joy for them to die and give up their spirits to the upcoming newborns. And I know I'm not supposed to put my opinion, but that guy who broke his leg didn't look too joyful. I mean, I could be wrong, but in my culture, screaming and f***ing agony is typically not a sign of joy. When Danny and Christian talk about it afterwards, he says that it was shocking, but the tone of his voice says otherwise. He suggests that they keep an open mind and try to acclimate to the culture. From this point on in the movie, they transition from spectators of the ritual to participants, becoming a part of the ritual and taking on the traditional clothing. And eventually, Danny is even able to speak their language during the dancing competition. As they become a part of the cult, they become a part of the cycle, and one of the women, Maya, takes an interest in Christian. Danny later becomes the May Queen. Maya, May, they could both be a reference to the calendar month of May, where spring starts to become summer. Pell explains that Maya was recently approved for some ritual, and it basically means she's allowed to reproduce, because she too is going from spring to summer and becoming an adult. Pregnancy is focused on throughout the movie. In the very beginning, Christian and his friends are out at the restaurants, and one of his friends sees their waitress walk away and says, you could be getting that girl pregnant right now. Kind of a weird thing to say if not for the circle of life metaphor. Also, the way that they're seated at the table, they're seated in an arc, similar to the way that the women are standing around Christian and Maya during the impregnation ritual. There's also a picture frame above the table of a woman bending over. The shot is composed so that only her breasts are in frame, another parallel to the ritual. That's the most literal reference to the rebirth metaphor, but there are also more symbolic ones, such as the women in the commune dancing in a circle around this phallic structure. During the feast, after the big dancing competition, an overhead shot shows a food sculpture in the middle of the table, representing an unclothed woman. And in the next shot, the phallic structure is lined up over the body of this woman. There are some images from the beginning of the movie before they go to Sweden that come back later in the movie. 
Above Danny's bed at her apartment, there's a picture of a bear kissing a girl. Danny's boyfriend ends up inside of a hollowed out bear for the final ritual of the movie. In that room that Christian is taken to so the older lady can ask him to impregnate Maya, there's an image of a bear on fire on the wall, another foreshadowing of his fate. In Christian's friend's apartment, there's also a similar foreshadowing. He has a framed picture of the scarecrow from The Wizard of Oz. In that final burning ritual, there are people whose corpses are stuffed with hay like a human scarecrow. Also, during that scene at the apartment, after Danny shows up, everyone kind of bails out besides her and Pell. He seems genuinely interested in her, and I think he already knows that she's fit to be the May Queen and possibly join his family. He tells her, I'm so happy you're coming. Then when the whole group arrives at the commune, the village elder says, we're so happy to have you, only making eye contact with Danny as he says so. When Pell and Danny have the one-on-one -on -one talk, he again emphasizes his pleasure that she came with. He challenges the idea that she's really happy dating Christian, and tells her the story of how his parents died and the family was there for him. Danny and Christian become more and more distant during this time, which is visually conveyed when he gives her the birthday cake with the candle and literally can't keep the flame between them burning. Pell explains that the family didn't bicker over what's theirs and what's not. We see this because the babies are raised by the community, not just the parents. When Danny looks through the keyhole and sees her boyfriend cheating on her, a group of several women cry and suffer with her, providing a contrast to her crying on her boyfriend's lap at the beginning of the movie and him not really reacting. Christian and his friend Josh bicker over who gets to write the thesis paper on this community, but they recommend that the two share the topic. I think this conversation that Pell has with Danny helps me understand the character arc that Danny goes through in the movie, and how the cult helps her get there. At the beginning, she's too emotionally dependent on her boyfriend, and she's afraid that she leans on him too much, which is only worsened by her family tragedy. He's considering breaking up with her because it's too much for him. Then, she's introduced to the family, and she sees how they have this community to support each other. Pell gives her thoughtful gifts, and she becomes a part of the family after winning the dance competition and becoming the May Queen. At the end of the movie, they ask her to pick the next sacrifice, and she essentially becomes the one to break up with Christian and become a permanent part of the family when she chooses him. Now, as far as the actual rune characters seen all over the village go, again, I don't really know the culture and I don't have a way of translating them, but here's what I was able to figure out throughout the film. There are two characters that come up over and over again. First, there's this R-shaped one, which is sometimes seen rotated or flipped. It's on the birthday drawing that Danny receives, at the top of the cliff where the jumping ritual takes place, on Danny's robes, and on the clothes that Christian receives. It can also be seen on the doors to the room where the impregnation ritual takes place, and I'm pretty sure it shows up in more spots around the commune. This is the only symbol in the village that I know the meaning of, because one of the cult members points to it in the Book of Rune characters and says that it represents grief. It's obvious why it's so often associated with Danny. The other one that appears a lot is this hourglass shape. It shows up in that weird comic strip looking thing that they refer to as a love story for some reason, and on both characters' outfits around the village. Most of the meals that they eat are done at a table that forms this shape when viewed from overhead. And the pattern that the fire burns in the final ritual also resembles this shape. Let me know in the comments if you have any ideas on what it could mean. Although this is only the second film by the director Ari Aster, there are a number of director's trademarks that are already evident. This part of the video will contain spoilers for his first movie, Hereditary. Family tragedy occurs in both movies. Midsummer opens with the death of Danny's sister and parents, and Hereditary shows the decapitation of the daughter, Charlie. Reincarnation is a theme in both movies. In Midsummer, it's implied that the spirits of the Ones are reincarnated into Maya's baby. Hereditary is all about reincarnating this demon named King Paimon. Obviously, both movies center around cults. This next one seems to be not only an Ari Aster trope, but also an A24 trope, and seems to be turning into a horror genre trope lately as well. I'm talking, of course, about using naked people, and more specifically, naked old people for scares. Not sure how this one got started, I think it may have been It Follows. So that's what I noticed about Midsummer, and I'm sure there's more that I missed, so if you caught anything, then let me know in the comments. If you want to see the Things You Missed episode that I did on Hereditary, then click the video on the left, and remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week. Ring the death bell for notifications, and I'll see you in the next one, assuming we both survive.